Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to have you join us for our first session of the Learning from the Past Looking to the Future series. We will look into the life of Christians who have gone before and can apply as a Christian church serving in Brantford in the 21st century. The first session will be led by Brother Ed Lamont, and it's on the Victorian era Anglican Bishop, the J.C. Ryle. Different time, this is the title he's given to it, different time, different place, same truth, same gospel grace. This could be recorded, so hopefully they will show up a little later on our YouTube channel. So welcome once again. I'd like to open with a reading from scripture. And I'll be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, the verses 11 through 20, Matthew 28. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. They worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's ask for a blessing from the Lord on our session tonight. Lord, we come before you and we're thankful for such a, a beautiful day as it turned out. We praise you, Lord, for the beauties of your creation, the time of spring. And we ask that you would bless as we look ahead, the planting and into the future, the harvest once again this year. Lord, you're a faithful God from year to year, even during a time of COVID. We do pray for those suffering from COVID, Lord. We do hear of the great challenges in India. We hear from our friends there, Lord great concerns as a lack of equipment such as oxygen cylinders and the great challenges of the people again especially in rural areas and even in urban areas where there is simply too many sick and we ask lord that you would have mercy that you would provide for them that you would encourage them and that lord they would learn to look to you and that many would be added to your church in india but also throughout the world bless us as we consider the life of Bishop Ryle and the lessons we can learn from him. Will you give our brother Ed what he stands in need of as he leads our session this evening? And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, Brother Ed, over to you. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we are glad that whoever could make it tonight, that we can try this new way of trying to continue our education programs, even though we haven't been able to do adult Sunday school uh, in front of the body this year. This is uh, another format where we can do a similar thing. Um, J.C. Riles, probably a familiar name to many of our senior members, especially, maybe less or so to our younger members. Um, I think he's probably most well known for his expository thoughts on the gospels, uh, which have been published in various formats. I, I know there's been some daily reading formats as well as some more extensive ones. And I'd like to start reading an excerpt from his thoughts on Matthew 28 that Rick opened with to give you a flavor of what he was about. Um, I think you can know a man, um, uh, even his writings passed uh, when he lived by what he has to say. So I'm gonna read a, a an excerpt out of what he says about Matthew 28. Uh, at first, how he glorifies Christ and also how then he has, how he has an evangelical outlook. Ryle says, let us observe in the first place, the honor which God has put on our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord, it says, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. 
This is a truth which is declared by St. Paul to the Philippians. God hath rightly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. It is a truth which in no wise takes away from the true notion of Christ's divinity, as some have ignorantly supposed. It is simply a declaration that in the councils of the eternal trinity, Jesus as son of man is appointed heir of all things, that he is the mediator between God and man, that salvation of all who are saved is laid upon him, and that he is the great fountain of mercy, grace, life, and peace. And it was for this joy set before him he endured the cross. Let us embrace this truth reverently and cling to it firmly. Christ is he who has the keys of death and hell. Christ is the anointed priest who alone can absolve sinners. Christ is the fountain of living waters in whom alone we can be cleansed. Christ is the prince and savior who alone can give repentance. He is the way, the door, the light, the shepherd. Let us also observe in the second place the duty which Jesus lays on his disciples. He bids them go and teach all nations. They were not to confine their knowledge to themselves, but communicate it to others. They were not to suppose that salvation was revealed only to Jews, but to make it known to all the world. They were to strive to make disciples of all nations and to tell the whole earth that Christ had died for sinners. Let us never forget that this solemn injunction is still in full force. It is still the bounden duty of every disciple of Christ to do all he can by person and prayer to make others acquainted with him. And that's a long reading, but it gives you a sample of how and what J.C. Ryle was all about. We see him elevating the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we also see him talking to people about having a vital, practical Christianity. Um, and it's something we'd like to do in these sessions as well. You, you may ask, why look at history in order to talk about what we can do now and into the future? Um, well, that's a method that has been effective also in scripture. If you think especially of the writer to the Hebrews, he focuses on historical examples, including in especially the well-known chapter 11. Uh, one author has noted about that, that ours is a generation that foolishly thinks history is irrelevant. This is partly because we are so self-centered and we don't really care about anyone but ourselves. Uh, many, many Christians, are shaped in their thinking by secular ideas of progress or th synthesis, and so think that anything that happened before our time is necessarily inferior. C.S. Lewis labeled this phenomenon as chron chronological snobbery, but the writer of Hebrews thought the past was an important resource to the present. Just think about Hebrews 11. It's emphasized over and over again. And in a similar way, when we look at individuals from the past, we can see what God has done in, the, done in them by working faith in their lives, and what they have done can be useful for us to learn from, and sometimes even be a warning to us in our day and time. So much of the material tonight is going to come from a recent biography by Ian Murray called J.C. Ryle, Prepared to Stand Alone. You might wonder a little bit about the subtitle. Um, J.C. Ryle was also born in a time or lived through an age where there were threats against the uh, church, against the inerrancy of scripture. There was a, a formalistic times. These were in the Victorian times. You can think of Charles Dickens and uh, all of his writings were in the same time period where we saw a very um, Christianity in name or in uh, works, but maybe not in the life and the essence of the people. So who was he? Uh, J.C. Ryle was born early in the 19th century, in 1816, and he died in the year 1900. Interestingly, his lifespan almost mirrored that of Queen Victoria, who was only born, I think, two or three years later than him. Um, and then she also died, I think, one or two years after him. So he fits squarely into the Victorian era. And the world at that time, the century prior, a generation or two prior and during his time was shifting from an agrarian culture to increasingly industrial. Um, he was born into this burgeoning merchant class in England. His own family was wealthy. His uh, grandfather had successful uh, silk mills. Um, and because of that, they garnered a lot of wealth and his father ended up opening a couple of banks with uh, two branches. So 
His uh, childhood context was a wealthy but absent father and a very attentive mother. Fortunately, uh, J.C. Ryle, and I find this the most interesting, so I'm going to do some of the readings out of that. He, he provided an autobiography uh, for his own children that was never meant to be published. And this has become available, and it's used by Ian Murray in his book, where we see some of what Ryle has to say about his own life and uh, existence. Uh, one thing that says something about the time, uh, which I'm going to read first, is what he says about his own young childhood. He was sent away to a boarding school, which was common at the time for middle and upper class uh, boys, uh, at the age of eight years old already. Um, he lived away from home. So I'll read a little excerpt here. Uh, he could remember that on the 8th of August, 1824, at the age of eight, his mother took him, and he notes my father took no such interest in those matters, to a private preparatory school run by a clergyman at Over near Nantwich. It was 20 miles away, which means he would see less of his home for three and a half years. He notes the merit of the school was academic ability of its head, with 16 boys from the leading families in Cheshire. They, all the companions slept in two rooms. It was good for learning. Ryle says, I was well grounded in Latin and Greek. We were also taught very badly writing, arithmetic, history, geography, French, and dancing. The demerit was the rough comfort and the too frequent absence of their tutor who also was the parish of Over. This left much time to run wild over the country to play cricket and to endure petty bullying and tyranny that occurs when there's an absence of adults around. So you see that as a very young boy, he, he's telling his own children that he was sent away and it was not for his good. I don't know if, how many children are with us. I mean, imagine having to move away from your house when you're eight years old and to go to a school run by a uh, minister with uh, 15 other boys and you're learning Latin and Greek and uh, various other subjects. So this he did for three and a half years. When he was 11 or 12 years old, he, after returning home briefly, he went to Eton College. Now Eton College is famous in England as being the, the uh, school for preparatory for getting into university. Um, it was founded in the 15th century already. And even today, it's known as a citadel for learning uh, for young people in England. So he spent seven years there. Um, in the beginning, he was sort of a middling student, didn't do uh, super good or bad, uh, but he also wasn't so interested in it. He was very good at cricket, uh, and that continued for years into the future. Uh, he, so he was a bit of an athlete. Um, but over the time that he was there, and he was there for about seven years, um, all of his teenage years, he became a stronger and stronger student. And at the end, he, end, he finished his career in Eton College with uh, uh, strong grades. And because of the good standing that he had, he was able to enter uh, Christchurch College at Oxford. His uh, first two years at Oxford were self-described as uneventful, uh, but his third year he explains, was the pivotal event in his life. So I'm going to read. It's interesting. He grew up in a Christian context, in a Christian home, uh, but this is the way he describes his, his conversion in his own childhood and what brought him to this point. Um, here's what Aaron, Ian Murray has to say, and then a quote from Ryle himself. This way of life went on, he says, until he discovered that I had got a soul. The remark seemed surprising, given he had been at church with his parents all his life, that he had been confirmed while at Eton, uh, and both there and at Christchurch experienced daily services of worship. So in the schools, they would have a daily time of chapel. But the explanation lies in the conception of Christianity in which he had been brought up. He recalled, my father's house was respectable and well conducted, but there really was not a bit of religion in it. We had no family prayers, excepting on Sunday nights and then only occasionally. Conversation on Sunday went on as much as on a weekday. Letters were read and written, newspapers read just the same as on weekdays. The plain truth is that for the first 16 or 17 years, years of my life, there was no ministry of the gospel at the churches we attended. The clergymen were wretched, high and dry sticks of the old school. 
and their preaching was calculated to do no good for anybody. We had no religious friends or relatives, and no real Christian ever visited our house. So he makes a statement that until he was about 21 years old, he had never prayed or read a word from the Bible. Now, he didn't mean that literally. Clearly, he had opened the Bible many times and prayed many times. But not until he was 21 did it really impact his life. That's when he was savingly uh, brought to Christ by the Holy Spirit working the word in him. Um, it is noted by other biographers that uh, he was moved by a uh, reading of Ephesians 2 by uh, a reader in a church. They would typically have someone read a portion of scripture. And, and just hearing Ephesians 2 was impactful. The, the verse that our church uh, has as its model, by grace you are saved and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That was impactful to him. He does say that it didn't happen all at once. It was, uh, he was saved over a period of time in that year. Um, so that changed him dramatically. He was uh, one that previously enjoyed a lot of socializing. Uh, he would go to various dances, uh, and after that time, he changed his outlook on what he wanted to do with his life. But coming out of Oxford, he, he wasn't settled. Uh, he did complete Oxford and scored very well. He wasn't settled on what he wanted to do. His own father, because of his status as a wealthy merchant and leader, uh, uh, bank owner in the area of Cheshire, was the actually the MP in parliament for that area. And uh, JC was considering following in his footsteps. Um, he did not end up doing that. He dabbled in law. He worked for a law firm for a little while. Then he started working, uh, doing some kind of sort of what I would term a loan manager for his father's bank. Uh, but he never really attached himself to any of these things uh, over a four year period as he was trying to determine what he wanted to do. And then something, uh, striking happened uh, to the whole family. They were a very wealthy family uh, and in one life changing uh, couple of days, the uh, family's banks that the father was the president of, his father, uh, collapsed. They had two branches. One of the branches he had hired a manager who unbeknownst to his father, um, or I guess he began to, became to know over time that his, this manager was making very uh, unwise loans to others. And uh, eventually the credit was uh, pulled out. Their, their loan papers were not being accepted in other areas. And there was a run on the banks and uh, the banks collapsed. All was lost, including their beautiful manor house that they lived in for many years that uh, I think from the previous generation of JC's grandfather. So JC Ryle at the age of 25 has to help his parents, his father um, dispose of all their assets to sell off for the debts that they owe. Um, he spends some time doing that. He calls it the most difficult summer where he had to live in the house as they um, tried to sell everything off to pay off some of the debts that they now own. So, then the family has to move away. Uh, his parents find a much more modest place uh, and JC Ryle moves in with some family friends and he, he didn't know exactly what he was going to do. He, he was considering going to law, but it would take a number of years to build up an income. And he unexpectedly ends up in the clergy. So, so not your classical uh, call that we would uh, consider in the reformed faith of how you would become a pastor, um, being called to it or called by the church. Interestingly enough, this is what happened to him. I'll read a little excerpt. In this state of indecision, Ryle tells us that he quote unquote unexpectedly, unexpectedly received the offer of a curacy. So that was a curate was a, a level in the Anglican church. Um, a, the rector of Folly, a, a town, uh, wanted him to take over a parish. And Ryle says this, I could see nothing whatever before me but to become a clergyman because that brought me some income at once. And later some others uh, accused him of actually just going into the ministry just for money, which was not uncommon at the time uh, for a stable income. He says it this way, I made up my mind to accept it, though with a very heavy heart. My father and mother, neither of them liked it at all. 
though they were quite unable to suggest to me anything better. And the whole result was that I was ordained by the Bishop of Winchester in Farnham Castle in December of 1841. He also notes, I never had any particular desire to become a clergyman, and those who fancied that my self-will and my natural tastes were gratified by it were totally and entirely mistaken. I became a clergyman because I felt shut up to it and saw no other course of life open to me. So what Ryle was trying to defend later on is that he, he didn't do it because he thought uh, he really liked the attention or liked to be in front of people, but he felt that there was no other course of action. And he adds one more comment about it that as he tells his children, I believe that God never expects us to feel no suffering or pain when it pleases us to visit us with affliction. There are great mistakes upon this point. Submission to God's will is perfectly compatible with intense and keen suffering under the chastisements of that will. I have not the least doubt it was all for the best. If my father's affairs had prospered and I had never been ruined, my life, of course, would have never been as it was and it would have been a very different one. So he later reflects and realizes, although he felt that that was not something he wanted to do or was inclined to do, that was something that God was leading him to. And he felt that there was no other course uh, for him to follow through than to actually become a pastor. Um, he becomes a pastor first in a, in a small parish. He's a single man at first. Um, he then moves on to a, another uh, parish for a short amount of time in, in a southern city, both in the south of England. Um, gets married, eventually settles in the in the area that he would serve for many years in the general area of Suffolk or Sussex uh, in England, towards the east, uh, in a more rural setting. Um, and from the family side, he ends up, I believe, having five children, first by his first wife, who died uh, sadly when their child was very young. He remarries and his second wife also dies prematurely after bearing a number of children, I think just five or six or seven years of marriage. So at some point, he's at a very low point where he, is, uh, he has two wives that have predeceased him and a number of young children. He does end up marrying a third time, um, and he's married to his third wife, who is an amateur photographer, and there's actually a number of her photographs that still exist of the uh, town that they served in for many years called Stradbroke, um, as photography was a new thing in the mid-19th century. But she, she serves with him and uh, lives with him. They're married for well over 30 years, I think. Um, and he, she died, she also predeceases him. So he, he lost three wives prior to his own death, but she uh, lived for most of his adult life. But so a difficult life uh, personally in some ways. During that time though, he became, two things happened to him. He became more and more uh, aligned with what which was called the evangelical party in the Church of England. These were people uh, and pastors that were concerned about uh, the, personal faith of individual Christians, that the gospel had to make a life-changing impact, just like he experienced, as we just read a little earlier, um, as opposed to those that were more formal in their style. There, especially in the 19th century, there was a, uh, a branch of the church that wanted to head more towards uh, the Roman, Roman Catholic. They were called Anglo-Catholics. They're still there in the Anglican church today. And there were, there were sort of two wings. He became more and more well-known as a, one of the leaders of the evangelical wing over a longer period of time. And he became a prolific writer. He started writing lots of tracts and pamphlets. Um, you know, we think of tracts today, we think of some little uh, two-pager that uh, might get tucked somewhere. But a lot of his tracts were more like 24 or 48 pages, things like that whole chapters in books uh, later on. Some of his tracks were put into books. And these became extremely popular uh, among the lay classes. So he had, he had a strong reading in what was considered to, more, to be more the working class. And the working class was in the uh, advance of the industrial age of the time was becoming more and more broad. Um, so he had written in this time period, these tracks. He also became known for his expository thoughts on the gospels. Um, and that's what, uh, as I read from one earlier, uh, were famous at his time and are still well uh, appreciated today. Uh, the various 
uh, writings he wrote on the Gospels, uh, very plain and clear teaching. Maybe to us, the, some of the language is maybe slightly outdated, but um, still very warm and, and uh, good reading, and I highly recommend it. I, the various versions are still in print. Uh, so over these years, as he became more known with the evangelical camp and he's writing, he also wrote uh, books that you might be acquainted with, some of you might know, called Holiness, Practical Religion, um, Old Paths, a number of books. Some of these included the writings he had previously done as pamphlets. Um, all good uh, reading material that was appreciated then and still appreciated now. So he serves for many years as a local pastor, but becoming well known as a leader. And then as he's in his older years, he's 65, um, he surprisingly gets um, called by a, a letter from the prime minister. Um, those of you who know a little bit of English history, it was uh, Benjamin Disraeli. He was a 19th century uh, prime minister during the time of Queen Victoria. He was a Tory or a conservative. And he had just lost a election to who would be Prime Minister Gladstone, also a name historically well known. And in that time period, uh, Disraeli um, wanted one of his Tory, uh, I think House of Lords representatives was very concerned because the, the uh, town, the city of Liverpool, which was a growing industrial base on the west part of England, um, big shipping center, a lot of industry. Uh, they wanted to put a bishopric there and the Tory MP or the, I think it was the Senator of the House of Lords for that area felt his position would be solidified um, because of the working class people there if they picked an evangelical man um, to become the bishop. So I'm not saying that's the only reason, but Ian Murray does hint that his appointment by Disraeli is somewhat political. And in fact, Disraeli offers it to him in the last week before he has to hand over the prime minister's office to Gladstone. Um, Ryle almost immediately accepts. And um, that is how the Lord and his providence made him a bishop in the Church of England. Um, that itself is very interesting. He, he, because he's a bishop in the Church of England, there's of course a number of things that go along with that. If, uh, in the English uh, tradition, there's a very structured liturgy. Himself, uh, Ryle felt uh, confident if the church maintained the uh, 39 articles of the Anglican church, which are uh, the foundational documents of the Anglican church, as well as the original common book of common prayer, that the church was on solid ground. So he, in his context, uh, wanted to make sure that those that served under him um, followed these truths. And he would reiterate that to his, uh, his uh, men, his clergy that served under him. He had um, what he thought was too few clergy for the population that they had to deal with. And his too few clergy were 340 of them. So it's it's something to think of the size of the even the administrative organization of uh, of of that being a bishop at that time in the Church of England, as it was the national church. So your uh, average citizen was a potentially a member of this church. Um, I'm going to finish with a, a few readings. One one I'll just uh, note. So what did Ryle have to say to his? Uh, to his clergy, um, there's a book of addresses that he made to his clergy. And I'm just going to read uh, one excerpt where he's telling them when he starts being a bishop there. And he, he is a bishop uh, for over 20 years until he's well into his 80s. And he, he had similar um, thoughts of maintaining the old traditions, standing upon uh, the truth of God's word. Uh, and he talked to them about how the, he wanted them to be doctrinal because doctrine provides the foundation for the gospel truth. So he he uh, had to come up with a, a scripture motto uh, for the new uh, bishopric of Liverpool. And he chose thy word is truth. And then he uh, impressed upon those that were underneath him that he wanted them to preach that word and to stand fast 
to the, the meat of the gospel. He, he writes this, or he speaks this. This is one of the speeches to his clergy. The consequences of the widespread dislike to distinct doctrines are very serious. Whether we like to allow it or not, it is an epidemic which is just now doing great harm, and especially among young people. It creates, fosters, and keeps up an immense amount of instability in religion. It produces what I must venture to call, if I may coin the phrase, a jellyfish Christianity. That is, Christianity without bones, muscles, or power. A jellyfish, as everyone knows, who has been at the seaside, is a pretty and graceful object when it floats in the sea. Yet the same jellyfish, when cast on the shore, is a helpless lump, without capacity of movement or defense or preservation. A vivid type of much of the religion today, which is leading principle is no dogma, no distinct tenets, no positive doctrine. We have hundreds of ministers, both inside and outside the Church of England, who seem not to have a, a single bone in their body of divinity. They have no definite opinions. They belong to this party with no views. So he wanted his the men that work for him to be faithful to the truths of scripture. And there was a movement at that time, both affected by modernism, uh, where the Bible was being criticized as no longer being inerrant, and also formalism, where there was uh, more emphasis on formal liturgy, uh, vestments and clothing and less on the impactful preaching of the gospel. So what does that have to say to us today? I'm gonna to use some of what me and Murray has said, maybe saying it in my own words. Ian Murray says, what can Ryle tell us today? And as I've titled this thing, it's a different context, but in the truth that we have to stand upon and the grace that we need to uh, broadcast is the same. The Bible is the word of God, which points to Christ as Savior, and we need a real relationship with him. If we want to serve God in our time, we must first know him personally, Christ in us, as we heard this past Sunday, and then we must stand strong on the objective truth of the Bible. We must have a real message of a Savior come to save people from their sins, and that by the Holy Spirit, it can make a real and eternal change in their lives. And something that we want to talk about that's happened in our own life. And if we don't hold on to this, the church just becomes a social club. I, I think of it almost like a chicken soup for the soul society or something, where you have this nice uh, veneer of nice talk and feel goodish, goodishness or something of that, if, that kind of terminology, but not, nothing with real bones, as Ryle would say. If we want to have an impact, we, we have to take the objective, powerful truths that uh, Another author, Dorothy Sayers, has once said that the doctrine is the drama. The dogma is the drama. The, the, what God has said in his word is the message we want to show people. Jesus Christ really came, really lived, died, and rose again, and through his Holy Spirit can really live in us today to bring those truths, to hold on to that. So Ryle recognized this. He was dealing with modernists and those of higher criticism. Um, I'm going to read a little excerpt of what he had to say about that. And we have similar challenges in our own time, which maybe we'll have a few minutes to talk about. Ryle said this, right near the end of his ministry, can nothing be done to restore the health of our Zion? I answer nothing but an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. More schools and universities will not set us right. They touch heads, but not hearts. Spiritual is the disease and spiritual must be the remedy. In plain words, we need more of the real presence of the Holy Ghost. For this, let us pray and beseech the throne of grace. And then he says about God's word, he that holds a Bible in his hand should remember that he holds not the word of man, but God. He holds a volume which not only contains, but is God's word. To me and many others, it is God's mouthpiece to a dark and fallen world. I abhor the idea of a fallible Bible, almost as much as I abhor the idea of a fallible savior. So we too have, have a concrete, real life-changing message. And we have to remember that that's what we're called to convey in Matthew 28 that we heard earlier. So some of the things that Ian Murray says that particularly we can look to Ryle to see is that Ryle emphasized we're created for the glory of God. He, what is the chief end of man, the Shorter Catechism says, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that's what Ryle was all about. 
In Ryle's case, he was concerned about the modernity and the formality in his time. We have the same, we have a different time, postmodernism, uh, the, the church going into an emergent direction. Uh, yet the, the same challenge remains to be relevant to our culture, to be caring, loving, and at the same time, stand upon the truth of God's word and to praise him and, and have worship that uh, leads us to awe and praise rather than driven by human emotion or human opinion. Interesting, another point of Ryle, which is harder to apply in our context, he, he wanted to emphasize that God's law was for all people. Well, there's two aspects of that. He really wanted to have the balance of law and gospel. I think we also in our churches care about that in the preaching. But he also wanted to saw the importance of the Church of England maintaining its status as a national church, specifically because it demonstrated that England at least officially recognized God and his law. And that sounds sort of foreign in our time and years. We're used to by now very much the separation of church and state. Um, our uh, government is deliberately secular. Um, so it's something to consider how uh, the relevance of the law and the church as an institution uh, is in our time. We would probably see it differently, but maybe there's some value um, with having uh, moral standards. And how does the church do that um, without the church presenting law instead of gospel? And the third thing that Ian Murray mentions is that uh, the praise of God's grace is the great purpose of redemption. Ryle himself learned the great truth from Ephesians 2 when he was converted in 1837 at the end age of uh, 20, 21 years old. And he spoke of the powerful working of God. Um, and even in times uh, where the culture seems to be moving away from the truths of God, uh, we know that God cares about the society and because he cares about his word in every society. I'll conclude with just reading how Ian Murray concludes. He says this, grace is the steadying truth for hard times. Grace is in no need of permission from man to build his kingdom. All who are given to Christ will come to him. No obstacle, no difficulty, no power of the world, and the flesh, the devil can prevent them. What he had begun, he will complete. What Satan seeks to do will be put down forever. When Christ chooses to finish his work, then praise will be forever. In that calm assurance, Ryle ended his words to his brethren and friends in Liverpool. And this is from his farewell address uh, when he finished being a bishop. In a little time, we shall meet again. Many, I hope, on the king's right hand and a few on the left and few on the left. Uh, till that time comes, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. And I misspoke there by adding an article, but you'll see something very definitive in Ryle too. Living in a time where there are many people that call themselves Christian, but didn't have a living faith. Even among the clergy, he was very discriminating. And even here, he said that there would be few on the left. And he's speaking to his own pastors and ministers uh, side of Christ. And we pray that too, that all of us might have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus, and that we might also be able to spread that in our community. That concludes what I have to say. Um, hopefully I kept within time constraints we had set out there, Rick. I think you did well, Ed, thank you for that. I'm hoping uh, everybody is sitting uh, comfortably in their living rooms or in their offices as they, they're watching us and maybe you've got a good drink. I've got my hot chocolate. I don't know if you folks have a coffee or a cold drink. Water. It's good. I was, I was, as I was watching, I was thinking, Ed, I, I wish I could bring you some water because uh, Seems like at some point you were coughing a little bit, but uh, I, I was on a roll. I just uh, roll. now now I can have a drink. That's good. So I'm going to put up a slide with the phone number again, just for those who want to text in a question. They'll come to me. So just let me uh, share that, and then we'll just keep talking while we're waiting for some of those to come in. Okay. So we still appear there in the small now. So, Ed, I was really struck by the story of um, how the Lord intervened in the lives of the royal family. So with the, the collapse of the bank. And I'm, I'm wondering, is there any indication of, of how his parents, you know, how they were impacted also spiritually by the uh, by that collapse? 
Uh, Murray doesn't really get into it that much. His parents' spirituality. I don't know if there's not a lot of information on it. Um, I find both his interact, his discussion of his parents and his children. He's very respectful with regards to both. Uh, but yeah, there wasn't a lot of information, at least in this biography. So um, it didn't seem to uh, to draw them. Let's say it that way. When he first became saved, it created some uh, family uncomfortableness. Because if, you, if you're in a context where there's basically sort of a, a dead spirituality, a veneer of Christianity, and then you get this, uh, uh, you say, young man alive to Christ, and he's going to, he tried to evangelize his family, and it, it went over a little bit poorly. Um, so it doesn't really say later on that, that I, at least in this biography, what happened to his parents in terms of their spirituality, but um, it doesn't say anything positive or negative but see i don't think there was nothing noteworthy that at least not in this part it, it, it's interesting that you know i think all of us can think of people who came to know the lord through a trial in their life of one form or another i can remember in columbia i met an architect who was one of the main leading architects of columbia beautiful big towers he pointed out to me that he did in bogota and at some point his partner absconded with all the money so he was left broke and the Lord used that trial to bring him to himself, such that he volunteered his time for Christian organizations there and ended up, you know, architecting very nice schools that we helped, uh, we helped to fund there. So it was neat to hear his story. And I'm sure we can all think of others. C.S. Lewis, I think, refers to pain as God's megaphone, right? The trials of life as God's megaphone to get our attention. And I think many uh, in this time of COVID, too, are being called, as it were, by the Lord. So you gave us a, a bit of a, a bit of a slow pitch there at uh, towards the end, uh, Ed, and I'll bite on that. Um, you said, I think I think it was an, an allusion to the whole area of you know our challenges in our time, similar to challenges in Victorian time that uh, Ryle was facing. So how would you compare the challenges we're facing today? Well, I think we're too in a time where uh, it, it's 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 structured differently like um he was dealing with modernism uh primarily we still have modernism that we're dealing with which is uh, basically uh everything is empirical uh there's you know a downplay of the spiritual but we're more in a postmodern realm which um everyone has sort of a spiritual or emotional essence but in in a way that um all truths are constructed so there is no particular objective truth so i do think it's it, what we're facing presents differently, but the answer is very similar. Um, we, we obviously have to contextualize the answer to who we're, we're interacting with, but the, the Bible has something to say for every generation and, and the objective character of the gospel and of the personal work of Jesus Christ is the same. Um, so, so that's the one thing. And the other thing is because of the postmodern envi environment, I think what we're seeing in our time is this concept of the emergent church um, where they are caught on to that we don't need a dry intellectual Christianity, but their answer is not always correct, which is um, to be vulnerable. We have to not insist that we know what's the truth. Um, and that's where they start going wrong because eventually if you start insisting, you don't really know what's the truth. And I'd say, what's the point of going to a church where they're not really sure what's even the truth? Um, and, and I think ultimately, uh, even if it has a short-term positive effect, it has a long-term negative where people are not receiving the ultimate answer, which is Jesus himself. Fair enough. So um, I've got another question here that says, you know, is there any, any mention of interaction between Ryle and Spurgeon. It seems like they lived fairly similar time frame. They did. Um, they, they appreciated each other. Um, I, I don't recall how uh, much interaction they had personally, uh, but they were known in the time as, uh, as two men. In uh, Murray's book, I don't know if I could hold it up. Uh, it might be hard to see, but right under above my my finger is a is a is a caricature of Ryle, and right down here is one of Spurgeon. Yeah, yeah. The, the the cartoon is trying to portray uh, 
uh, it's a cartoon from the 1880s or 1890s, 1883, is trying to portray the struggle in the Church of England between those that wanted to pull it away from evangelical religion and those that are pulling it in that direction. So they have Ryle and uh, Spurgeon tugging on the same side, even though Spurgeon, of course, was a Baptist, so he was not part of the Church of England per se. But yeah, it doesn't talk a lot about personal correspondence. Um, Ryan was a real Church of England churchman. He really, he really was endeared to the state church, and he was trying to bring it back to its reformed roots from the time of Thomas Cranber and some of the very original archbishops. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting example of trying to work within the mainline church, and, and we certainly see that in, in the Netherlands as well, with the, the Bonders, as it were, you know, striving to work from within the state church. Many, I guess, our forefathers left in 1834. But others stayed and, and were still very similar in their theological outlook to us. And I think they held on up until maybe 10 years ago or so when finally um, there simply was no option for them but to leave. So uh, and it's interesting how the Lord has also blessed those efforts to, uh, to strive to uh, work from within as well as from without. I think there was some positive effect. If you think of men, uh, even in our own time or in the previous generation, Dr. Martin Lord Jones was Anglican, of course. He in, he in some way is part of the evangelical revival that brought writers like Ryle. Ryle for a time period in the early 20th century was seen to be a bit outdated, a uh, man of the 19th century. And uh, it was sort of in that revival of the mid 20th century that his writings became popular again. And popular among uh, Reformed uh, and Presbyterian people as well, which is very unique. You know, I remember as a child hearing about Bishop Ryle, and you're like, we read people that are have the term bishop in front of their name? Um, yeah, because it was something, it's something unique. Um, but he did uh, have a power in his time, um, and even now still through his writings. So just a note, somebody tried to call me just now and left a voice message. The challenge with that is that we're 15 seconds ahead of you. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a, a little, little difficult. Maybe if you've, if you've got a couple of things to say, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just mute myself here for a minute and just hear what the voicemail, there might be a question in the voicemail, led. So yeah, No problem. Um, I'll, I'll tell something interesting about uh, Bishop uh, J.C. Ryle had a son who also became a bishop in the church. Um, and what was unfortunate is that his son was actually enraptured a bit by the modernist movement and moved off of the inerrancy of scripture. Um, father and son together um, had a very good personal relationship, but uh, they did not see things the same way spiritually. In fact, to the extent that uh, the father, Bishop Ryle, at one point removes his son Herbert, who at that time is not yet a bishop, from being one of, his, his, of what was called an examining chaplain to examine um, those that were aspiring to be part of the ministry. And, and it's just a reminder to us that um, being uh, faithful to the truth, um, knowing the truth personally and absorbing those concepts is not a, uh, it's not genetic. Uh, we're thankful we know the Lord works through the generations by his covenant, but it's not something that's a uh, covenant autonomy is automatic. And here we see, although uh, Ryle's own son became a churchman, he yet was, uh, didn't follow in his father's footsteps in terms of uh, standing upon the uh, faithfulness of scripture uh, and was open to all kinds of uh, different perspectives in the church. And it's a sort of symbolic of what happened to the Church of England in the early part of the 20th century, um, which many of the branches had uh, let's say, uh, agreed to the concepts of the higher criticism of scripture, no longer felt it was in itself. The word of God was included in it, but it was not itself the powerful word of God. Hopefully Rick has uh, heard what he has to hear now. <laughs> anyway, I hope you uh, have gotten something useful out of this uh, first trial of this method. It's a bit unique uh, for me also. I don't think I've ever spoken to a screen. Uh, I've been on a lot of Zoom meetings for the, in the last year, as many people have, but not actually spoken uh, in the form of a, a bit of a uh, address or 
what you might call it uh, to a screen before. So hopefully it came across okay. Yes, yeah, so that was Pastor Pontus left a message and asked me to call him back. So I did call him back and he wanted to comment how much he appreciated uh, the little presentation you made, Ed, and uh, was looking forward even to a little more on Bishop Ryle. But I did explain that we hope to highlight uh, different men from the past and just uh, give a little bit of a biography and then some, some highlights of their ministries and uh, some application to today. Uh, he commented that when he first uh, came to Canada from the Netherlands, it was uh, as a young man, it was one of the one of the first books he picked up to read, and that was Practical Religion by uh, Bishop Ryle, and it had such an impact on him as a young man. So uh, I wanted to share that story, and, and I can say myself as a, a young man, that book, even though the, the language is a little difficult, I think it's worth worth the extra effort to uh, to plow through, as it were. It's a little long winded, but you know you can you can sort of speed read over a few sections. But I think each chapter in Practical Religion and then Holiness. Uh, have a lot to offer to us, even in this day. You know, beautiful chapters on the Lord's Supper and uh, on various aspects of the Christian walk. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that, Pastor. Pro? Well, I'll, I'll give the pastor two plugs in one week. Um, uh, we have in our own congregation, Pastor Prunk uh, is himself a historian uh, and a worthy one, and, and he has written uh, a book. There's been a series in The Messenger, and there's still currently a new series in The Messenger on some of the American Puritans. Um, very worthwhile, and we appreciate your work, Pastor. Uh, interesting, Ryle himself was also a church historian, and well, his most famous book at the time of his death would have been, I think it was called Christian Leaders of the Past Century, where he was writing about Christian leaders of the 18th century, and he himself said, we have to accent not the men themselves for their greatness, but for the faith that the Lord endowed them with and how they used it. So we're, if you will, following him, his footsteps, talking about him like he did in his time to the ones that went before him. Very nice. So just as we close off here and try to keep it to an hour, um, I guess we're hoping to do some more sessions in the future. I know you had one or two others that you were thinking of doing, Ed. Are you able to yeah. share who those might be? Yeah, I, I have in my mind to do Eric Little, who is the uh, the gold medal winning sprinter from uh, Scotland, who then became a missionary to China. So I'm thinking he's he's on my mind for next. I thought of maybe doing John Knox. You had a potentially a couple too. We don't know yet whether this will be next week, but we hope to do a few more of these throughout the spring before we hit summertime. Yeah, I was, I was hoping to do Thomas Chalmers, a uh, Scottish pastor has a fascinating story on how his church reached out to the poor in his area with, I think, some very helpful applications to today. Another name I was, I was thinking of was indeed uh, Charles Spurgeon, who I think has a, a fascinating life with all he went through. And I know our pastor, Pastor David, was uh, potentially hoping to do at least one person as well. So we'll see how this goes. We'd love some feedback uh, from you on this, how this came across. And uh, Hopefully, if not next week, the week after, uh, we'll do another Wednesday evening, the Lord willing. Meanwhile, uh, have a very good evening, and perhaps, uh, Ed, you can close in prayer with us. Sure. Gracious Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time. We could do a brief consideration of this uh, man of God from the past. We're thankful for the evidence of grace in his life and how strong he stood for the truths of the gospel as he himself knew the powerful working of the spirit and wanted to get that message out um, through his pamphlets, through his tracts, he wanted to have that gospel reach the ears, the hearts and the minds by your spirit's grace of the people in his generation. And then he wanted to stand on the faithfulness of your word for the only foundation as our only foundation as it, Paul has written is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray that we would stand upon that, that if we, as we desire to be evangelical, also as a church in our community, that we would be able to have the boldness to do that, that by our life and speech, we'd be known as ones that we could talk about our own transformation through God's grace and that we could share the truth of the power of the gospel to others. Lord, remember us throughout this week. Bless our whole congregation in this time, especially those that have special needs, special health concerns, you know who they are. We'd ask that you would hold, uphold them by your power and grant your spirit's presence of comfort. 
bless our whole congregation, each one. And we ask all these things, not because we deserve it, but in the finished work of the person of Jesus Christ. And this is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good night, everyone.